Chapter 56, American Intersections, Jazz and Blues Traditions. And this is part of our unit on secular song. So we will also talk about jazz when we do piano music and Scott Joplin and the Rag. And we'll also talk about jazz when we do the stylized dance music unit. Because most of the, well, anyway, the dance music. Um, so uh, jazz and blues traditions, blues doesn't have to be jazz and jazz doesn't have to be blues. So blues is, is sometimes jazz, but doesn't have to be. Anyway, the roots of jazz lie in African traditions, Western popular and art music and African-American ceremonial and work song. So it's an amalgamation. It's a mixture of several things. A lot of times this is what happens in America, right? Melting pot, isn't that what they say? Blues, a genre based on three line stanzas set to a repeating harmonic pattern was an essential factor in the rise of jazz. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, Louis Armstrong, Oh, well, we're going to sample a little bit of him because of his singing. He was a trumpet player and a singer uh, associated with New Orleans style jazz, characterized by a small ensemble improvising simultaneously. It's uh, Armstrong's groundbreaking improvisatory style was a huge influence on jazz musicians, including singer Billie Holiday. Louis Armstrong, as a matter of fact, in New Orleans, it's the Louis Armstrong or Airport. That's the name of the airport. Um, he is like the king of jazz, influenced and in, uh, the genre in a big way, including Billie Holiday, which we're going to hear a piece her um, of uh, sing a song because it's blues, and she was a wonderful, wonderful a blues jazz singer. Uh, we'll talk about swing jazz later. Jazz is said to have started in New Orleans, and it did. Why New Orleans? It was the most cosmopolitan city in America after the American Civil War. And uh, many people lived in New Orleans from the West Indies, Africa, France, England, and other European countries. New Orleans, New Orleans was a gateway to the interior of America, up to the Mississippi River, all of the way to Pittsburgh. And of course, along the river, there's St. Louis, Memphis, and other trade routes was based on cotton for decades. New Orleans was a free city after Abraham Lincoln declared the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863. The free, this freed all slaves and New Orleans belonged to the Northern Army early on in the Civil War. This was a, a major, major target of the North Army to, to overtake New Orleans, and they did early on. And they controlled then the Mississippi River after they did this. So strategically, it was a smart move. There was a migration of people to New Orleans and brought the call and response style from churches and slavery itself, both from inner America. Interesting fact during the civil, well, it's more than an interesting fact. It's, it's part of the reason why uh, jazz developed after the civil war in New Orleans. During the civil war, up to 10% of the soldiers in the North and the Southern armies were in the military band. 10%. Robert E. Lee said that at the end of the day's battle, music was more important than medicine or rations. Every unit had uh, a band. And uh, you'd have these battles. They would see each other the night before. And the one group was over here. The other group was over the next day. They would go battle. And the end of the day, they're tending to their injured and the, and the dying people. And, and the North Band would play. And then the South Band would play, and they would hear this going on. So they didn't play at the same time. There's a certain respect. And sometimes uh, they knew the both songs, and they played the same songs together. Hard to believe, but it's true. After the war, many of these horns, because 10% of the soldiers had horns, they didn't play violins, 
and they went back to New Orleans because it was a major uh, cosmopolitan city. Now, this is also a, a, a factor in why things happened in New Orleans and why it is a root of, of uh, jazz. A after the Civil War, of course, there was a reconstruction movement that had a positive intent, right? The, the North against the South and, and uh, the slaves were freed. Uh, rich people had lost all their property because of the freedom of this or the freeing of the slaves and so there was a big upheaval upheaval and to attempt to try and make things uh normal as far as uh blacks and whites living together and that was the intent but it failed miserably and and um because of politicians changing laws within 10 or 20 years after the civil war but during this time, there were three social racial groups in New Orleans. There was the whites, and there was the Creoles, and the African Americans. And the Creoles, which is mixed races of European and African American, so half African American and European, could be French, could be English, uh, Spanish. So a Creole was not always just a French uh, and black. Creoles had been a recognized ethnic Group, racial group for hundreds of years, actually. Many were wealth land owners, wealthy landowners, and some owned slaves, actually. The Creoles were to be separate but equal to the whites as far as education, at least, up until the Civil War. Well, actually, until after the Reconstruction. They were free persons of color. Many Creoles were highly trained musicians in the European tradition. And then there was a third group of African-Americans, mostly former slaves, which are like, oh, down in the lowest part of the economic ladder. But in 1896, and who says that Supreme Court rulings don't have a huge impact on things? In 1896, a Supreme Court ruling stated separate but equal laws, laws were legal. Creoles now became legally Afro-American because of the laws now, there were only two racial groups in New Orleans, the whites and blacks, which included the African, which included the Creoles. So you had these educated Creoles now mixed with African-American uh, former slaves. And you have this new mixture of virtuosity with native, you know, folk music. That's This is also a mixture of from Africans that are from different countries and different um, cultures. So we, you know, we had African Americans, or they weren't, well, they were blacks from West Indies. And um, because anyway, So New Orleans after 1900 uh, is, is uh, you know, approximately when, when jazz started and after ragtime. And I think ragtime was also a big influence of African-Americans. So it's important to know that Louis Armstrong played the trumpet, right? And he also was a singer. And he had several hit songs in the, in the 60s, maybe. I, I, I don't know when he died, but later in his life that he was, was singing. And you probably have heard some of his songs where he sang. But he invented this uh, method called scat singing and where you improvise the song with your voice and with syllables like do da ba da ba dee ba da ba. And, and uh, they're, they're not real words, right? They're just sounds. So we have, again, this big mixture of uh, African-American. They're, they're not all the same, right? Call and response, vocal inflection, storytelling techniques, um, work songs. Work songs are real important to keep everybody together and for safety reasons, as well as for efficiency, right? Work songs were used in the ships by Romans and Greeks to keep everybody together. And uh, if you worked on a railroad, if you were going to lift rails and do heavy work, it's very important that everybody works together. 
and avoid injury and to get the job done. So uh, music and work uh, is is not is part of you know like I said back to the Greeks and Romans. When we talked about the spirituals prior to this. And the minstrelsy, we talked about that. So that's part of this. It's like, wow, all these different things affect jazz. The Mississippi Delta area. We're going to look at a map in a minute here. So again, you have this mixture of African European styles. And in the country, you had these rural blues with steel string guitar players. And uh, perhaps I'll play something for you that in, in, at another time, uh, some, some original blues on guitar. Not my original, original performers from the, the Mississippi Delta. So uh, typically we talk about the 12 bar blues. There's a six bar, 16 bar blues, but it's not really in, that important compared to the 12 bar blues. Uh, so they're telling us that this uh, music from Congo Square and I'll read a slide next and it'll explain that. So again, Louis Armstrong, 1901 to 1971. So his hit songs were shortly before he died. And he worked with Billie Holiday and helped her with career also an African-American. Okay, uh, Congo Square, do I have to do this? I guess I do, let's see here. This is a uh, Congo Square, it's in, in, and I took this picture at Congo Square in New Orleans, it's still there. Congo Square is in the vicinity of a spot which Humus Indians used before the arrival of the French for celebrating their annual corn harvest and was considered sacred ground. The gathering of enslaved African vendors in Congo Square originated as early as the late 1740s during Louisiana's French colonial period and continued during the Spanish colonial era as one of the city's public markets. By 1803, Congo Square had become famous for the gathering of enslaved Africans who drummed, danced, sang, and traded on Sunday afternoons. They were allowed to do this. Their owners allowed them to, to group together Sunday afternoons. By 1819, these gatherings numbered as many as 500 to 600 people. Among the most famous dances were the Bumba, Bambula, Kalinda, and the Congo. These African cultural expressions gradually developed into Mardi Gras, Indian traditions, the second line, a which is a um, a, a uh, term that describes a, a movement of, of dance and eventually New Orleans jazz and rhythm and blues. Here is a picture, the Mbambula dance in New Orleans Congo Square to the accompaniment of drums and singing is depicted by uh, Mr. Kimball in 1886. We have drums, dancers, singers. I don't know what this is. You know, it's not a microphone. Now, I want to play a little bit of this piece, and it's a piano piece, but it's important, and we'll Sample some of this uh, composer's works later. He lived from 1829 to 1869. Louis Moreau Gottschalk was a Creole and he was a brilliant uh, musician and composer and pianist. And he spoke French. And as a, as a young boy, 12, 14 years old, they sent him somehow to France. And he studied with uh, Franz Liszt and, and Chopin, heard him play. And uh, then after he, when he became an adult, he traveled all over the world, but he's from New Orleans and he grew up within like a block or two from Congo Square. 
So undoubtedly, and he even talks that he heard the music from his window in his house that he could hear this music. So he, this is a piece called Bambula, written by Gottschalk. But there has to be a connection. Bambula by Louis Moreau Gottschalk. The Civil War, right? And of course, we have uh, our northern states and we have the southern states. We have our free states and we have our slave states. A uh, couple of things I want to point out. One, this is the border between Maryland and Pennsylvania is called, uh, well, some lawyers, Mason and Dixon, made this line. And uh, there are posts still there every so often in the, uh, the stone markers that it's called the Mason-Dixon line. And typically we talk about Dixieland as south of that border. Of course, Maryland was a, a northern state and West Virginia. But nevertheless, when we talk about Dixieland, it's from the Mason-Dixon line. And then as well, Texas was, of course, a slave state. And so as the slates, states were entering in the Union, uh, there was argument, you know, are they going to, we going to allow them to be uh, legally owned slaves or is it going to be illegal to own slaves? And this was the big debate. And um, Texas was not a state. And if we go back to the Alamo, the people that, that uh, were involved in the, in the Battle of the Alamo uh, were slave owners. And they went to this part of Mexico because it was part of Mexico because at the time it was legal to have slaves. In a short while, not I don't know what the particular reason was, but Mexico outlawed the owning of slaves, which included the territory of Texas, part of Mexico. And uh, these were slave owners. So suddenly they, was, they were breaking the law by owning slaves. Shortly thereafter, they revolted from Mexico. And uh, of course, we had the Alamo and how things unfolded. But then they uh, became Texas, an independent nation, and immediately applied to be joining the United States as a slave state. And they did. Uh, the river system, here is New Orleans. And at this time, uh, well, around the Civil War, New Orleans was the sixth largest city in the United States. And all the other five cities were over here. You know, Boston, New York, uh, Philadelphia, Baltimore. They were all the top five here. The only city in the South that, well, the largest was New Orleans. And it's right on the river and the Mississippi River. All these rivers... You, you can see how many drain into the Mississippi Basin. This watershed is huge. Pittsburgh is over here, where you have the Allegheny River and the Monongahela River joined to become the Ohio River. Of course, these are all Indian words. Susquehanna, Allegheny, Monongahela, Ohio, Mississippi. I don't know about Connecticut, but those are all Indian words, American Indians. And in, anyway, so because of this watershed and the movement of people to New Orleans, immediately after the Civil War, you had people from, uh, you know, kind of a gospel background and slave background and uh, opportunities. All this cotton was moved down to here and in the United States. Uh, was a major producer of cotton in the world and still is like one or two as the number of uh, uh, production of co cotton.
here's a picture I took crossing the Ohio River. And it's just to show you the size. We talk about the Rio Grande River. This is the Ohio River in Pittsburgh. This is the Mississippi River in New Orleans. The water is just, it, it, it's, it's just so impressive how much water there is here. And of course, this allowed navigation all the way up to Pittsburgh and further to Chicago, St. Louis. All right. Let's listen to uh, an example of, of Louis Armstrong. This is actual footage from 1933. And he's singing a song called Dinah. And it's important as an example of scat singing. Louis Armstrong became hugely successful. And some people accused him of sucking up to the whites. And he said, look, I like what I'm doing. I get paid well. Uh, people like me. I'm an entertainer. And so that's what he did. So let's sample this Louis Armstrong Scott scat singing. The next number we're going to swing for you is one of the good old favorites. Yes, uh, Dinah, Dinah. Look out there, boy. Are you ready? Look out. In the state of Carolina, if there is any, you know, show to me, Dinah, the dick not blazing, who love the city's gazing, to the eyes of Dinah, me, baby, every man, but I shake with fight, oh, cut my dynamite, change the mind, baby, this is your zeal, then you wanna start to China, baby, I'll have a new line, oh, baby, oh, Dinah, Dinah, oh, Dinah, oh, baby, Dinah, me. This is a painter captures the spirit of jazz performance in his colorful collage, Empress of the Blues. Uh, I don't know if he's actually referencing Billie Holiday. She probably, I, I, it must be. Here is Louis Armstrong and Billie Holiday. They did a, a movie together in 1947 called New Orleans. And some really wonderful footage of of jazz musicians from this time. I haven't seen the movie. Put it on your list to watch that movie. Regarding Billie Holiday, lived from 1915 to 1959. She's often called Lady Day. And I believe there was a movie just uh, in the last 20 years or so. She was not formally educated, was probably, you know, abandoned as a child and had to uh, survive by being a prostitute and, um, in New York City. And so she started singing to make money and was quickly recognized as a uh, unusual artist. This is 1933, 18 years old, right? 15, 30. 18 years old. Right. In 1933, she recorded with white clarinetist Benny Goodman. And this was not the normal procedure with, with blacks and whites to play together. Well, actually they did, but the clubs didn't permit it. And, and so Benny Goodman started using Billie Holiday as a singer. And some clubs would say, we, we not gonna, you, you can't have a black musician perform at our club. And he said, if Billy Holly doesn't play, I don't play. And so B Benny Goodman most of the time got his way. And um, 
just by because she was a great musician. He didn't care what color she was. Incidentally, they, they titled this slide The Jazz Singer. In 1927, the movie, you know, there's a movie that was called The Jazz Singer. And that movie is considered the first movie with synchronized audio and video. It quickly ended the silent movie business. The movie stars Al Jolson. He was a nationally known professional singer. If you're going to make a movie with sound, let's get somebody who's a singer and we can really promote sound. And it's curious because well, he also appears in a movie in blackface in 1927. This is still not unusual for performers to blacken up their face to perform. This is a vaudeville ritual, and, and they I don't know when they stopped, but this was uh, common. It was not, it was usual. We're going to sample a song by Billy. I believe she wrote it. It's called Billy's Blues. It makes sense. Well, it says written by Billy Holiday, excuse me. So let's look here. It talks about choruses and verses regarding 12 bar blues. It's important to know that a bar refers to a measure that is marked off with bar lines. 12 bars means 12 measures of four beats. The form 12 bar blues also further divides into three four measure phrases, three times four is 12. The last four measures distinctly ends the 12 bars in a final, final cadence. And it is often called the turnaround because you then go back to the beginning, the top, and repeat the 12 bars as many times, excuse me on the, on the spelling, as you want. One time through is called a chorus. You play 12 bars, that's one chorus. And then you could play it as many times. Sometimes you would sing it. Sometimes it could be, done instrumentally. Louis Armstrong might sing it and then and then play it with trumpet. But the harmonic structure of the 12 bars uses the three primary chords in any key. We would call it the one chord, the four chord, and the five chord. Chords are often substituted that fit the same harmonic structure. There have been thousands of songs written using this format. Elvis Presley you ain't nothing but a hound dog. It's a 12 bar blues. I can't think of any right now, but I mean, just the, you don't think they're blues, but they Beatles songs that are based on the 12 bar blues, but they don't sound like blues, but it's the same 12 bar blues. Billy Holiday, 1915, 1959. And what's really special about her is the way she interprets music and it has a, a distortion of the rhythm that is her style. She is not real accurate. She doesn't have a huge range. She doesn't have a beautiful voice. It's the way she interprets it and expresses herself that it makes her a, a, a wonderful blues singer. The best. Her song, Billy's Blues, recorded in 1936. Choruses two, three, and six, she sings. Chorus four is a clarinet improvisation for 12 measures. And uh, chorus five is a trumpet for, for 12 measures. The way the song starts, and, and it's not unusual, for blues songs, songs to start this way, it's like, how do we make an introduction? Well, we have 12 bars and the last four, right? Four, four, and four. And the last four bars are the turnaround and they bring us back to the top. So let's start the piece with the last four bars of the 12 bars. And after four bars, we'll be ready to start the song. And so that's exactly the way this goes. And I encourage you to count the beats, count the measures. The first one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Yeah, so you count the measures. And the first four or the introduction, and then the 12 bar blues starts. And if you count, you can hear all the choruses. Pay attention when the um, singing changes to instruments and vice versa. Billy Holiday, Billy's Blues.
incidentally, uh, she has a song that she wrote called Strange Fruit. And I know you can find it on YouTube, but it is very, very disturbing because the song is about a man that has been hung and he's hanging from the tree. And she, the song is called Strange Fruit. Very disturbing. And that will end our chapter 56, Secular Song, an example from the blues with Billie Holiday.